guess what? You're listening to episode 100 on the Wild Wellness Podcast. So to celebrate and sort of take a pause and look back on the last 100 episodes, I thought it would be fun to look at the most popular episodes. I picked 10 of them. And these were the ones that were most downloaded collectively from you and other listeners. So enjoy listening to clips from these episodes, whether they were your favorite part or not. And I always think it's fun to listen back to these because there may be little snippets that you just didn't get the first time and it will land with you different depending on where you are now. So enjoy. And hey, by the way, if we haven't met, I'm Jenny Holbert. As a holistic fitness and essential oil specialist, I am all about helping you live and sweat in sync with nature. Wild Wellness actually stands for women into living their dreams because I hope that whatever I share helps you take care of your body so you can take all the adventures. So here's the Wild Wellness Podcast. Episode 73, What is Rest? Everything I do in my work obviously revolves around astrology, and I tend to look at everything I do in life and in my career through the lens of the stars and the cosmos and the natural rhythms, and rest is no different in my opinion. Full disclosure, I feel like it's easy for me to say I'm bad at resting. Isn't that an interesting judgment? I think a lot of us say stuff like that about ourselves, and I just want to, you know, be honest in this conversation and I don't really like saying that about myself. I think a better way to rephrase it is I'm learning how to rest in a way that feels really good. And I'm also learning that you can't rest wrong. <laughs> you can't rest right. There's just um a uniqueness to the particular rest that you need. And so in my client sessions and with myself, I'm constantly searching for um a life which includes rest, that feels authentically um, good in my nervous system and in my body. And so sometimes the classic ways we rest, whether that is, you know, taking a bath or sleeping in or whatever it is people say we should do, those don't tend to resonate with me very much. And I often find that I'm actually happiest and feel most at peace and most at rest when I'm creating something. And I think that that's really valuable information. But in terms of the body needing rest, and it certainly does, I let the moon give me permission. The moon can help us schedule in or punctuate a busy life with a little bit more mindfulness and a little bit more awareness of when we can go full force and when we can have permission to do things a little bit differently and maybe create a little bit more space in our schedule. So this is a pretty complex conversation, or it can be. But the very basics of it are just the lunar cycle and its phases. So when the moon is full or in its really large phases, so more than half, whether it's waxing or waning, I tend to believe that this reflects our capacity to show up for life, kind of our bandwidth and our ability to be stress resilient. And so when the moon is in these phases for this about two week period, I just allow myself to be more busy. I allow myself to have more on my list. I allow myself to get swept away with a creative project. I allow myself to feel rested by my creativity. You know, that is a real thing for me personally. But when the moon is in its late waning and very early waxing phases, so that could be after the last quarter moon and beginning at the new moon until the first quarter moon, that two-ish week period, I still do, but I allow more space in my schedule. I allow my scheduling to be more intuitive and therefore more rest just tends to pop up and rest in terms of what we typically think of culturally as resting. That was Claire Gallagher, the body astrologer, and now for episode 80 on Moon Time, you'll hear from Nina Boyce. So when it comes to Moon Time or thinking about menstruation, I like to think about it being such a powerful force within our body. A lot of times we really get down on ourselves and our symptoms and we fight 
uh, the week before our period especially and then even the time when we're on our period we really want to fight it we don't want to slow down we don't want we don't like the feelings of being a little bit more tired or moody or maybe the pain or cramps that come along with it but when I think about it being more of a powerful time in my life, a time where I can become really intuitive and harness this cyclical uh, nature moon energy, it takes on a whole new meaning and feeling within my body. And that's something that I would just like to share with all of you and something I love to share with my own clients, that it's a time for us to celebrate our bodies and it's also a time for us to feel our emotions, to honor our emotions and to know that when things come up or whether it's aches and pains or something more emotional or spiritual that comes up, that our body is sending us an, an important message and um, it's our time to listen to it and to honor that. So a couple of things that I like to do during this time is um, I do tarot readings as well as um, offering Reiki. So I, I love to grab my tarot cards and my journal and sit down and really just tune into me and gather up all of the guidance that's surrounding me, whatever that is that you believe in, um, listening to that outside universal guidance and tuning into the messages that my own body is trying to send me and putting a plan into action for the, the coming weeks when I'm feeling a little bit more energized or when I'm coming out of my period. I feel like it's time to tune in and listen and then after the period is over, then it's time to put all of that intuitiveness into action and start living really in my power. And now for a clip from episode 79, what nature already knows about this season. Here's what I want to remind you. That cold blast of snow that forces you inward does not have to send you into a spiral of fear, self-doubt, or negativity, or wondering what's wrong with you or what's wrong with everything else. Because maybe it's part of the cyclical nature of life and the cyclical nature of our bodies. I want to remind you that as women, we experience cycles each month. Now, most of us are familiar with rhythms like circadian rhythms, where we sleep at night and we're awake during the day and light regulates that. That's the cue for that kind of inner timing device that we have. But another type of rhythm is an infradian rhythm. And this lasts longer than 24 hours. It can be weekly, monthly, or annually. So a woman's menstrual cycle is considered a monthly infradian rhythm. It's like a second inner clock that we have as women that affects so many things in our body from our metabolism, immunity, stress response, reproduction, what's going on in our brains, lots of things. So many women, including myself, have grown up with these messages about uh, shame, disgust, or disregard for our periods. Like it's an inconvenience and it's something that we should try to hide or avoid. And I think it's important to ask ourselves how that influences our ability to cycle. Because when we understand and accept that our mood shifts, our energy changes, and we may feel different at different times of the month, we're much more in control of our own lives. And we can make choices with confidence that are more aligned with what we truly need instead of trying to live up to some societal pressure that isn't realistic for us anyway. And now from episode 78 called Morning Routines and Rituals During Times of Transition and Change, you'll hear from Leah Song. Deep wilderness can be something that is takes a little bit more effort and, and time to have access to um, and something that you know, I think can literally reset the senses and rebalance the, the mind and the body and the soul. And it's something that is deeply worth us valuing, I think, as a, as a culture and protecting um, and, and, and keeping available as, as the lungs and the, I think, in a way, the spiritual kind of anchor of our, of our earth. Um, and, and even just kind of touching on the parameters perimeters that's the word I would want <laughs> of of you know wild spaces can really be revitalizing so hiking and trekking climbing and uh, you know sailing 
booting, all, all, all of these kind of softer and quieter recreational ways to get out into the, into the wild spaces as a, as a tiny, teeny, tiny person. You know, they are a really big part of our spirit and my own personal need for adventure and need for wild spaces. So that is an open book, and I spend as much time as possible when I'm off the road conjuring up ways to go as far in as I can. And now for episode 75 on Huga for your health. So Huga is that amber glow that you have when you light a candle or stomping through the snowy woods with some soft clothing. That could be Huga. Or wrapping yourself up in a blanket by a fire and sipping on some hot tea. That is definitely Huga. So let's talk about Huga for our health with, with a focus on the winter season, even though that's not the only time to experience Huga. I think it's very easy to do that in the winter. And I will offer you some ways that you can get more of this cozy well-being into your life for hopefully a happier winter season. First, let's talk about how Huga helps us to eat more mindfully. So sweet foods and hot beverages are part of Huga. Hearty stews and soups, think of warm things that have simmered for a while on the stove or all day in the crock pot even. Huga is also, according to the little book of Huga, about bringing a cake to work with to share with friends or a box of pastries to the party. Enjoying food with friends in general is actually part of Huga and enjoying every last bite, like really savoring it. So is homemade food, by the way. The process of baking or making something can be huga, but nothing too complicated or fancy. Like, it doesn't have to look pretty. So think of that simple soup recipe that just simmers on the stove for hours or even fermented sourdough bread. And just the concept of that is simple, but not necessarily a fancy process or a fancy display. So when you enjoy foods and you eat mindfully, it tends to relate to huga because you let that flavor marinate on your taste buds. And not only in that way can you really not help but eat more slowly and mindfully, but you're really enjoying it. It's that, it's that cozy well-being and that sense of happiness that you get when you let that flavor kind of sit in your mouth and you eat slowly. But mindful eating is so important because it gives us that awareness of hunger and fullness in the process of eating. It's about noticing our bodily sensations or emotional states as they arise even. So to eat mindfully, you have this curiosity that you bring instead of judgment and self-criticism. Instead of say, ignoring your chocolate craving, you simply observe the sensation as it comes and as it goes. And rather than telling yourself it's bad to eat sweets, you're just mindful of how you're feeling physically and emotionally when you crave those sweets and enjoying the flavors, enjoying the fact that there's no good or bad when it comes to food necessarily. It's how we are thinking and feeling about it. So for Huga, enjoying all the flavors is very much a part of that experience. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying all the flavors of a piece of cake even, while also maybe consuming lots of vegetables on a daily basis. I'm not promoting the consumption of a piece of cake every single day without loads of vegetables in there as well. I think that'll help your body thrive best. But, you know, according to the little book of Huga, it's about the foods that we eat that make us feel good too. So I think that's really important to focus on and that's part of mindful eating as well, not just the sensation of eating itself and noticing the sensation of hunger and fullness, but also just the flavors and noticing how different foods make us feel instead of just rushing through and consuming food just because we do need it, you know, we do it in a rush sometimes and we can slow down and eat more mindfully, which is very Huga. So according to the little book of Huga, a research study on what people associate with Huga showed that hot drinks came in first. So think hot tea, mulled wine, definitely coffee, which took first place actually, and nourish your body with warming foods. That is very huga. Now, not all of those things might be best for everyone. You know, it definitely depends on your body and what suits you best. I think that's important to pay attention to, but you can still get the essence of those warming foods for huga. 
Now for episode 58 on healthy boundaries to manage your energy. You may need to decide on boundaries with your focus. So I think it's important to consistently ask ourselves, what do I want? Am I doing those things that matter the most to me? I know it's so cliche to say, but you have one wild life. I say it all the time. And so make it count, my friend. Life is completely your creation. And if you're not doing things, doing workouts, eating food that feel good, and instead they feel just like something that you're in a habit of doing, or they feel like obligation, that's an energy drain. And it could be contributing to your lack of energy for life overall. And if that's not the case for you and you're doing what you love, but you still feel this overwhelm, could it be that you need to organize your focus? Maybe you need to organize your schedule, your projects, your training plan, your other goals. And if you're going to start with one thing in this area, start by writing down your goals and the steps that you need to achieve them. Did you know that people who write things down as far as their goals, are 42% more likely to achieve them. To me, this is a no-brainer. Like, just do it, right? (laughs) You already are that much ahead just by writing things down. So trust me, it will help you organize your projects, your ideas, your plans, your training, your workouts, and your schedule. And speaking of workouts, this is so important because if you don't really have a focus or a goal of what you want to be training for or how often you want to move your body, or what you want to actually do for a workout, it just becomes frustrating. And you often end up going, 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 because you don't plan for proper rest and recovery. It's not part of the plan. And sometimes our brain just thinks that we need to just go out and do it hard all the time. So be sure to schedule sweat and rest, and that is the best way to stay focused. Episode 74 on flow state workouts. And the first way is to make sure there are clear goals every step of the way and immediate feedback on your progress. So in other words, you know what you have to do and you know how well you're doing it. So if you were running a race, you would know what distance you're completing or what you have to achieve to finish. You know exactly how well you're doing because you can see your time or the mileage splits that you're ticking off along the way. You know whether you're winning or losing, right? Or for a non-workout example, if you have a financial goal, you know the number you're going for and you're tracking it so that you can see your progress and see how well you're meeting it. So goals have to be clear. People are happiest when they do things that are clear. So research actually shows that people report better moods and feelings when they're confronted with challenging tasks that have clear objectives, which is why breaking down large goals into smaller manageable steps is really critical to allow that positive energy to flow through the experience as well. Because if you are breaking it down into small goals, it's going to help you to kind of have that check mark of knowing that you're on your way. And breaking down those goals into smaller manageable steps is something that you're going to check in with often. So it will continue to keep you in that state of flow and giving you that consistent feedback on your goals. So for example, if you want to run a half marathon, you'll get feedback by checking off the mileage that you're doing each week as you progress towards that. Or if it's just a single run and you're going 10 miles, you get feedback by checking the mile splits as you go. Or maybe you're struggling to get out for a run and you decide to just go out and run for 20 minutes because you know you can just do that. You set the watch, you commit to running for that duration of time. Now you've shown yourself that you can do it. You can get out there. And then you decide to go for another 10 minutes after that first 20 because you feel even better than you did. So when you just do something and feel it, you get confidence that more is possible and how you can move from there. It's all that feedback that you're looking for. And this kind of reminds me of what we talked about in the recent episode on using intuition to guide your workouts. And sometimes if you're not sure what to do that day or you're really sensing nothing from your body, you just go out and you try something. When you do that, you can get into flow state by then checking it off and saying, okay, I did that, giving yourself that feedback that that's possible, and then maybe deciding to go more. 
Next is episode 82 on how to find your workout style and optimize your energy. So there's a free quiz that goes along with this episode. If you haven't taken it yet, it's at jennyholbert.com forward slash quiz. And you should go take it to find out what your workout style is by nature. So the first thing to consider is your fitness level. What's your current fitness level? This is an important question because you may be just coming back to workouts after an injury or some downtime. You may feel like you're in the best shape of your life and getting stronger every day. I don't know about you, but I've been in both of those places and the way I feel about workouts, what I'm doing and what's appropriate for me at the time is very different depending on which situation I'm in and you'll find the same, I'm sure. And just so you know, there's no right or wrong here. It's not that one is better than the other. It's just all part of different cycles that we might go through different phases. So maybe neither one of those applies to you. Maybe you're not just coming back to workouts after an injury downtime. Maybe you're not feeling in the best shape of your life. Maybe you're just maintaining your fitness. You're not really training for anything specifically. You're just keeping your body sort of at a base level of fitness that feels good to you. And maybe you're not working out much at all right now for whatever reason. And again, none of these are better or worse than the other. It's just that the challenges that you might face with your workout choices, with your training, with how your body responds, with managing your stress levels, all of the factors that go into you getting the most out of your workouts and taking care of yourself so you can continue to do those workouts, these challenges are going to be different and the motivation and effort is probably different too. So knowing where you are right now, like truly where you are and not pretending that you're somewhere else is a really aligned way to know what your workout style perhaps is even in this season. So how else does this help you find your workout style and optimize your energy? Well, the interesting thing is that each of those scenarios, as far as fitness levels go, has a different flavor or feel to it, kind of like summer feels different than winter. And so I think we can learn a lot from this and even how to transition from one to the next, perhaps. So maybe you are coming back from an injury, but you've been back at it for a while and now you're ready to improve your fitness in some way, maybe get stronger, maybe have greater endurance, whatever it may be. So there's going to be a transition between these seasons. And it's just important to know, like I said, where your fitness level is so that you know sort of what season that feels like and what challenges might be coming up and what also you might want to maximize because you are there. I'm all about, you know, it is what it is. You are where you are. And what can you do in that present experience to make the most of it? Now for a clip from Low Tox Living at Home, which was episode 81. Tea tree. You may have heard of Melaleuca, which the common name is tea tree. So Melaleuca, tea tree specifically, has so many different, like dozens of compounds and limitless applications. The leaves of this tree has actually been used by the Aborigines of Australia for centuries. They would crush the leaves and then inhale the essential oil to help with clear breathing and also apply the leaves directly to the skin for a cooling effect. Now I've used tea tree oil for years for helping with things on the skin. Like if I start to get a breakout of any pimple or zit, I use tea tree on it. If I've had anything funky going on with my toenails or fingernails, or if I have a cut or an abrasion on the skin, Tea tree is like first aid on the skin, but it's also very purifying. So I will diffuse it and I will use it in my cleaning products, in my sprays, my laundry detergent to help with reducing odors and also to help at the core level of cleaning. And I use it too when I make my dry shampoo. Uh, It's actually a great oil to help cleanse the scalp. It absorbs moisture. It's also good in a DIY deodorant or a sunburn relief serum. There's really so many countless ways you can use tea tree. And finally, stick with me here. Episode 85 on workout mistakes you just don't want to make. 
And the last thing I want to mention that really seemed to get perpetuated through my education in fitness was how we use exercise as a weight loss tool. There's this rule that if you want to lose weight, you should focus on how exercise can help you with that, right? And I'm not completely disagreeing with the fact that exercise can be a part of weight loss. Yes, exercise can help someone lose weight, but weight gain or weight loss is impacted by so many factors, including what you eat, your hormones, your sleep, your stress levels, and a lot of other things. And if you put five people on the exact same workout program, they would not all lose the same amount of weight. Plus, it's possible to be active and to meet guidelines that are recommended for exercise and health and still be overweight. The other important thing here is that health isn't simply defined by the number on the scale. So exercise alone cannot guarantee your health or your ideal weight. And I guess I, I ask the question, why are we even looking to workouts to do that for us? I understand why it's a factor in it, but the point that I want to make here is that what I said in the beginning, that it gets perpetuated that exercise is a weight loss tool and we don't see it as anything beyond that. When we look only at exercise as a means of burning calories or losing weight, we create a really dangerous relationship with it. It becomes a check off our to-do list. It becomes a chore. It becomes something we dread. It becomes something we have to do. We remove the pure enjoyment from it and our habits around it become really negative as well. And I can say this from personal experience because I remember at one time in my life counting the number of calories I burned from a workout so that I could compare that to the number of calories I ate so that I could lose weight. And that was what I was taught in school to do as well. I was taught if someone wanted to lose weight to look at calories in versus calories out. And there is such a difference now for me in the fact that I move my body because I want to feel strong, because it helps me to change my state, because it feels like an adventure. So if you love moving your body and you feel this way about it too, this probably isn't relevant to you what I'm talking about, but if you find yourself thinking of exercise as a tool in your weight loss kit and you don't have any other meaning around it, then this conversation is for you. And what I want to offer you is to find another meaning, find enjoyment in moving your body, not just for weight loss sake. So what do you think? Ready for another 100 episodes? <laughs> we'll see, my friends. I do know I love creating these mini lessons for you, and I'm so grateful that you're listening. If you want to get the full episode of any of the ones I shared, then all the links are in the notes at jennyholbert.com forward slash 100. And again, thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing the podcast with someone who you think might benefit from listening. And until we chat again, go live your one wild life.